Okay. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for this webinar hosted by the USAID funded Water, Sanitation and Hygiene Partnerships and Learning for Sustainability Project, also known as WASH PALS. Today, they will present highlights from their newest literature review on hygiene, hygienic environments for infants and young children and discuss implications for implementers and share the project's next steps to fill some of the evidence gaps. WASHPALS recently completed this review of the scientific and gray literature to capture the state of knowledge of the health risks to infants and young children from fecal exposure in home environments, focusing on historically underemphasized sources and transmission pathways not disrupted by the traditional suite of WASH measures. Our moderator today is Jesse Shapiro, the Environmental Health Lead and Senior WASH Advisor and Sanitation Focal Point in USAID's Global Health Bureau. Our presenters today are Julia Rosenbaum, Senior Behavior Change Specialist with the WASH PALS Project, Francis Nigare, a Research Advisor with the WASH PALS Project, and Jeff Albert, the Deputy Director of the WASH PALS Project. And please see their bios on the Big Marker website if you'd like more information about each of them. Before we get started, a few things to know about the webinar platform. Please locate um, the Q&A box on the lower right hand of your screen, and that's where you're going to submit questions at any time during the presentation. But questions won't be answered until we hear from all of our speakers. And you'll also be asked to participate in a couple of polls today. And if you have a, any technical issues, Grace and Dan on our webinar technical team will do their best to help you out, and they'll monitor the Q&A box for any issues. I need to also let you know that today's webinar is being recorded, and we'll share the recording probably early next week. And you can find slides from today's presentation and the literature review under the Handouts tab, and that's on the um, top right of your screen. And the recording and related resources will also be available on USAID's Water Sector Knowledge Hub, globalwaters.org. And I will now turn things over to Jesse. Thank you so much, Patricia. Uh, as Patricia said, my name is Jesse Shapiro, and I'm the uh, I'm the one who manages the the Wash Pals contract on on behalf of USAID. Wash Pals stands for uh, Wash Part Partnerships and Learning for Sustainability. Uh, it's a five year project that's focused on learning uh, about sustainability of sanitation and hygiene interventions um, globally. Uh, particularly in USAID's priority countries. Um, overall, the project is, is really focused on identifying some of the major evidence gaps and learning about how we really drive uh, sanitation and hygiene uh, at scale to universal access. Uh, the WASHPALS contract uh, has a, a great group of uh, implementing partners. It's led by the uh, Tetratech uh, and also includes Aquaya. Uh, FSG, FHI 360, and IRIS Group, and you'll hear from some of them today during this webinar. As, as the WASHPALS project sat down and started to think about what questions and what gap areas we want to investigate in the sanitation and hygiene sectors, we really thought about our overall goal of achieving universal access in sanitation and hygiene and outlined sort of three very broad questions to help shape our thinking, and those were essentially when and how are these sanitation and hygiene approaches effective currently and sustainable? What do they cost? And how do we repeat that success at scale to really achieve that universal access? And we def defined three categories of programs we want to look at. Uh, the first being community-led total sanitation, which is a very predominant approach in the rural sanitation sector, as well as market-based sanitation. And the third is hygienic environments for uh, infants and young children, or as we sometimes call clean play spaces. <clears throat> and that's what the webinar is gonna focus on today. For each of these three areas, we have done global literature reviews and consultations with key stakeholders and are developing uh, reports that are, that are put out publicly. We've already completed that one for the hygienic environments. 
um, which this webinar is based on today. We've developed similar ones for CLTS and market-based sanitation, which are forthcoming. But today in the webinar, we're going to focus in on this hy hygienic environments for infants and young children, um, based mostly on the desk review that was just completed uh, and it is shared also as part of this webinar. So with that, I will hand over to Julia Rosenbaum, who will take you through the content. Thank you very much. Thanks, Jesse. Uh, stage. Let's jump right in uh, to address the question, why study hygienic environments? It's spurred by a number of convergences, uh, decades of rigorous dietary interventions and reduction of diarrheal disease morbidity have proven to be only modestly successful at reducing growth stunting. Poor wash, inadequate caregiving, and food insecurity underlie these immediate causes of growth faltering, but they also persist even with the provision of traditional nutrition and wash interventions. So with this, there's a growing research interest in the relationship between hygienic environments and child growth. And along with that interest, there have been interventions to reduce infant and young child exposure to excreta in the home, both products and behavior change measures that are being deployed, but their effectiveness is unknown. So with this as motivation, USAID's WASHPALS project conducted a, a review of the scientific and gray literature, complemented by dozens of, of key informant interviewers with researchers and implementers to synthesize the latest understanding of key pathways of um, key pathways of fecal microbe ingestion by infants and young children and their links to diarrhea, enteric dysfunction, nutrition, growth, and other development outcomes and also to inventory what we know about WASH interventions breaking the traditional and underemphasized pathways, what's being done and um, what outcomes they yield. So today's presentation follows the outline of the literature review itself. We'll first review the pathways that prevent uh, major exposure risks to infants and young children and try to shed light on the relative magnitudes of the, the various pathways of risk. We'll summarize the evidence of WASH interventions at reducing the risk of diarrhea and growth faltering in the under fives. We'll focus on underemphasized sources and pathways of transmission and their impact on infants and young children. Highlight early efforts to block the underemphasized pathways of exposure and their effectiveness. And then lastly, to discuss WASH PAL's next steps. If you do have some questions as we go through, we direct you please to the to the chat box where you can uh, start listing your questions that will be monitored and organized for the Q&A session. So before you is the iconic F diagram used for decades in its many forms to illustrate the exposure pathways, showing how open defecation, is spread through the F's of fluids, fingers, fomites or surfaces, flies and floors, then contaminating food and water supplies and infecting future victims. Wash interventions to disrupt the transmission pathways in the F diagram have traditionally focused on increasing access to an improved water supply, improving drinking water quality, food hygiene and refining hand hygiene and sanitation measures through reduction of open defecation and the adoption of improved toilets. So before diving in, some audience participation. We're asking you to um, take a look at the question and click on your answer. What poses the greatest risk to the health of infants and young children in home environments? And we do ask you to read your answers and select one, or you can decide to answer later, but you must click something if you'd like to see the, the slides that follow. Oh, my apologies. I don't think I've got the poll. We'll have the polls ready. I'm sorry. Hmm. We're hearing that the poll is not polling. Okay, we'll move on. So um, posing the greatest risk to home to uh, infants and children in the home environment 
In fact, whichever answer you chose, what I would say to you is that this is one of the findings of our literature review is that despite all the studies documenting um, the transmission pathways, we still don't know much about the magnitude of risk in the individual pathways. Okay, I understand we've just lost the presentation. I'm going to pause for just a moment to see if our hosts can get the presentation okay, back yep, up. Okay, I'm, I'm reposting it, yep. It's uploading. It should be ready in one second. Excellent. I believe everyone should once again have the presentation in front of them. Okay, excuse that interruption. So in the next section of this review, um, of the, excuse me, the next session of the literature review, but also um, for our presentation, what we're gonna look at is how effective are these more traditional WASH interventions, particularly at reducing infant and young child exposure and reducing diarrhea. So what we did was we looked at the impact of, of um, we looked at a, a really dozens of observational studies, trials, several systematic reviews, and um, meta-analyses. We do want to note that while there's quite a bit of literature on the subject, most of them look at household level interventions rather than community level interventions. And as we talk on, we'll, um, we'll highlight why, why we're making this point, but we did find quite a bit of literature on the subject. The evidence of WASH interventions at reducing the risk of diarrhea among under fives is mixed. And unfortunately, this is going to be some of the, the motif of our presentation of the literature review is that um, there's quite a bit of mixed evidence without clear implications. So regarding the, the link between WASH interventions reducing diarrhea, and we're focusing now on that outcome of diarrhea among the under five children, we find that the evidence is stronger for particular types of wash interventions, such as water supply and point of use water, than for others. We also have an emerging body of evidence from high quality experimental studies that also show mixed but generally positive effects of improved sanitation on health outcomes such as diarrhea, enteric dysfunction, soil transmitted helmets, and child growth outcomes. Additionally, there's substantial evidence uh, around the effectiveness of hand washing with soap in preventing diarrhea and STH infections. However, the magnitude of the effect differs between studies and across contexts. The recent WASH benefits trial in Bangladesh, which many of you have been following, shows clear diarrhea protection from the WASH intervention. But very important to note is there are no additive effects of WASH plus nutrition over nutrition alone. The analysis also showed that combined WASH effect was indistingu indistinguishable from hand washing or sanitation, so that a comprehensive WASH effort had no greater bang for the buck, if you will, no greater out, um, outcomes than hand washing or sanitation alone. In this RCT, we have to note once again that the intervention targeted selected households. It was not a community-wide intervention, nor did it target all households even within those intervention communities, rather select households receiving select interventions. But nonetheless, the results are notable. However, with these findings in mind, it's important to note that when looking at the impact of both comprehensive wash and the particular types 
of WASH interventions. Um, first, the quality of the evidence is quite varied. And so while we'll report to you um, overall conclusions from the, the range of data available, the quality of the evidence is quite mixed. Second is that there's great variability by intervention type, as I just reviewed, but also within each intervention category, so that different water treatment options, for instance, or different water supply options have quite a different uh, effect on diarrhea. And then lastly, we wanted to point out that the combination of baseline condition and intervention matters significantly. So looking at the brilliant graph on the right, which is pulled from the Wolf Cochran Review, any particular intervention, say household water quality, depends on the nature of that intervention itself. So are we going from uh, unimproved water source to uh, basic piped water, if you could jump from the first to the third box? So it, the, the impact will depend on the combination of baseline measures, where's the community starting from, and then also the intervention itself. And through that, you have the somewhat complicated calculus of, of the effect. So that that combination of baseline condition and inter, intervention type matters significantly. Still looking at the results from the WASH benefits trials, um, but this time in Bangladesh and Kenya, as well as the shine results, we reflect on the, the, um, the effect of WASH on child growth. So now we're shifting our focus from looking at the impact of the WASH interventions on diarrhea to that of child growth. And still focusing on the WASH benefits and shine results, we find that there's no protective effects of WASH on growth and no additive benefits when combined with nutrition in all three of those RCTs. Remember, though, that these three, are, uh, three RCTs all applied select household interventions, not aimed at community-wide. So still looking at WASH and its impact on growth, there were much fewer studies than for looking at the, the effect of WASH on diarrhea, but we also highlight a Cochrane review that's on the right side of your screen in which they conducted a meta-analysis from evidence of 14 cluster randomized control trials. And they suggest that WASH interventions confer a small benefit on stunting in children under five years of age, but no evidence of reducing wasting or weight for age scores, the two other anthropometric measures often used to, um, to calculate changes in child growth. So again, a, an imp, a small benefit for on stunting, but not on wasting. So while potentially important, the conclusion is based on relatively short-term studies, and none of which is of high methodological quality, but it's still notable, although should be treated with caution. Moving on, um, I've been emphasizing as I talk through all these findings about whether we're looking at household or community-wide WASH measures. And looking at this null effect of WASH interventions on growth in the SHINE and the WASH benefits in both Kenya and Bangladesh, it's really important to ask the question of, of how important are these community-wide sanitation measures to achieve herd effect and see impact. So in all three of those RCTs, as I'm saying, sanitation and other WASH interventions were at the household level with varied but limited compliance over time. When we talk about herd protection, uh, two main papers demonstrate community coverage imparts this herd protection. And it's absolutely critical, though, to highlight that this evidence is, is garnered from particularly remote, sparsely populated settings, so it could vary a bit in a, if applied in other settings. So that community coverage imparts herd protection. Supporting this, Amy Pickering et al.'s work in a, recently community, in a recent community-led total sanitation trial provides evidence that suggests promoting intensive community-wide behavior change in sanitation behaviors through CLTS over a 12-month period can improve child linear growth. And this is also notable. It's the first study we have that directly links CLTS efforts and successful CLTS efforts with improved child growth. So 
so we've been talking a lot about the evidence of WASH on diarrhea and growth. And as I said in, in the opening, the relationship between diarrhea and growth is not the relationship between diarrhea and growth is not highly associated and that even with these reductions in diarrhea, growth faltering still occurs. Some studies point to a clear relationship between dirty environments in general and linear growth, uh, EED markers and parasitic infection. So if you look at the graph at the bottom of your screen now, you'll see pictured uh, some of the findings from uh, Lynn et al study which contrasts significant differences in growth in very, queen, very clean versus very dirty households. And so if you look again to the, um, the distribution curve on the left, the red, if you can see the color, this would be the, the growth of children in the very dirty households. And then shifting to the right, the standard distribution curve, you see that there's um, a f almost a full standard deviation to the right. And what that means essentially is that you have severely and moderately stunted children in dirty households and children having normal growth curves um, in the clean households. So what this is showing us contrasting this difference um, again is that impact of generalized filth, if you will, in households on the growth of children. So over the past decade, a, a condition called environmental enteric dysfunction, or EED, which is a, a condition that's characterized by the inflammation of the small intestine lining that inhibits permeability and nutrition absorption. And this EED has been identified as a potential major mediating pathway that links poor wash conditions and chronic undernutrition. And we say potential mediating pathway, and that's why we are always careful to put the claim or the EED hypothesis as we talk about it. But that picture on the right, uh, on the top right, contrasts a healthy gut to one with EED. And the difference, of course, is striking. The EED hypothesis proposes that chronic exposure to fecal microbes, a, a, a salt of feces on the gut, independent of the effects of diarrhea has a, as a significant underlying cause of that child growth faltering. And it's really thought to explain why even the most rigorous dietary interventions have had only modest effect on reducing child stunting. Though this ideology of, of EED is not fully understood, it's been linked with the ingestion of high loads of fecal microbes. So while gaining focus as a study outcome, while EED gain, sort of is gaining focus as a study outcome because of its potential importance, proving it's been proven quite difficult to measure. And looking at the last bullet on the screen, you'll see that the widely used urine test has been recently shown to have very poor agreement with blood and stool biomarkers of stain infection. So even though we're recognizing the importance of measuring it, we're still challenged at how best to do that. So, in short, substantial evidence is mounting that additional or underemphasized pathways are affecting these the infants and young children's health and growth. And when we talk about fecal exposure, we basically mean there's other unexplained sources of ingestion and exposure that aren't accounted for in our more traditional models. And those are specifically the direct consumption of animal feces indirect exposure to both human and animal feces through eating dirt, wash water, and exploratory mouthing behaviors. And that these, these pathways, these underemphasized pathways merit attention and intervention. So what you see before you is a modified F diagram that introduces those animal sources. You see those cows and chickens down there on your left. And it also highlights some of those underemphasized pathways. So we will try again for some audience participation. Um, there we go, success. Um, and we just want to ask from our participants if your organization has attempted to address any of these underemphasized sources, the animal feces or pathways. Again, you have to give some answer if you'd like to move on.
I cannot see results in front of me, but I will be. Thank you. Good. Well, we have actually a very even distribution of the poll. It looks like a horse race with the yeses slightly ahead of the other answers, um, but we have very even distribution of, of, of our participants having addressed contemplating or not yet or not, I should say, um, addressing the underemphasized sources or pathways. And we are going to ask, please, in the question and answer sessions, uh, particularly those who are currently or contemplating to, to um, uh, add some commentary on your experience and perhaps your motivations for, for doing so. So we've talked a lot in this presentation about the impact of uncontained feces on the health and growth of under fives. But what happens to the feces of those under fives? Most sanitation projects to date target adults. And as we can see in this cartoon, you have a, a village celebrating their open defecation free status and the kids still off there doing their thing in the open. So where does it all go? The feces of the infants and young children. Only recently, a few programmers and researchers are starting to document what happens to infant and child feces, and a lot ends up in the open. In an analysis of the DHS and MIX surveys, the multiple indicator cluster surveys, uh, in 25 of, I'm sorry, in 15 of 25 lower and middle income countries, more than half of the households practiced unsafe disposal of feces of children under three. The highest levels of unsafe feces disposal were reported among the poor rural households, among the youngest children, and where other household members were practicing open defecation. But really notable in the data was that we were still seeing, or we still see, a whole lot of unsafe disposal in houses using improved sanitation as well. Some more recent research by Christine George showed that unsafe feces are linked with having more E. coli in children's play spaces, higher enteropathy scores, greater odds of wasting, and lower weight for age. So again, strong associations here between unsafe feces disposal and child growth faltering. Turning to uh, another major underemphasized source of exposure for infants and young children well, is animal feces. And we'll make three points in this section. One, that animal feces are an important source of zoonotic bacteria and protozoa. That animal feces are abundant. And third, that exposure to domestic animals and their feces is a significant risk but much is still unknown or undocumented about the link to child health. So animal feces are abundant. Um, although it's somewhat, um, somewhat obvious, it is substantiated in the evidence that animal feces are more widespread where free range animal husbandry is practiced and more concentrated where animals are corralled within the environments where children sleep and play. In one analysis in rural India, we put this up illustratively, um, nearly every fecal oral pathway explored was highly contaminated with animal feces in both the public and private domains. More than half of household water was found to be highly, fecal, highly contaminated with animal feces and 90% of the hands of both mothers and children were found to be highly contaminated. How much of that feces contain, contain diarrhea causing pathogens is another research question that wasn't answered in this study, but what we know is that feces are everywhere. So exposure to chickens, dogs, and livestock present a significant risk, but again, much is still unknown about this link to child health. After examining data from 30 sub-Saharan countries, Kaur and his co-authors concluded, and I, I read to you, they concluded that domestic animal husbandry is at the same time protective against stunting, an indicator of chronic malnutrition, and a risk factor for all-cause all mortality in children. 
They note that the cost to health and growth may co-occur with those potentially potential nutrition benefits offered by increased food access from domestic animal husbandry. So it's actually a complicated equation, the net gain or loss to child growth status, which is attributable to domestic animals. It's a complicated equation that's really not fully understood. Systematic reviews looking at the association between domestic animals and risk infection. Um, in the Cower review that I just mentioned, 13 countries, um, and 13 of the countries in that review, domestic livestock ownership is a risk factor for elevated child diarrhea, but in another 10, they found a protective association. Another systematic review, um, the Zambrano review, for those of you who know, also found more than half, about 69% of the studies reported that association between exposure to domestic animals and diarrheal disease. Uh, this review actually looked at diarrheal disease overall, not particularly for infants and young children, but the trends follow. Um, while the evidence is mixed, there are high quality studies documenting the presence of animals and their feces is associated with increased infection, undernutrition, and stunting. Um, two studies that we highlight, one is the Mosites et al. study that identified a modest but statistically significant decrease in stunting prevalence that resulted from increases in household livestock ownership in Ethiopia and Uganda, but not in Kenya. So again, uh, we have trends, but it wasn't consistent across countries. And in another three country analysis of data from the Alive and Thrive study, um, Hedy et al. document that the presence of animal feces is associated with stunting in Ethiopia and Bangladesh, as well as a pooled sample, but not in the Vietnam site. So a key takeaway, while the results are mixed, uh, risk is most pronounced when infant and young children and animals, particularly poultry, are sharing living and sharing sleeping quarters. Um, a little more as we uh, peruse the data, while domestic animal ownership adds nutrition, nutri excuse me, while it adds nutrients and income, having an animal corral within a child's sleeping room was associated with elevated EED scores and it doubled the odds of stunting in Christine George's work in Bangladesh, uh, and close exposure to an overnight corralling of poultry posed a concurrent risk for undernutrition due to that increased risk of infection in the HETI studies. To the Western city dweller, all feces are bad and should be hygienically disposed of, but to rural householders, feces are often viewed as a resource used for fuel, building material, and our fertilizer. Often it's young children's job to run around and, and collect that feces. To date, little has been documented about the human health risks from exposure to those productive uses of animal feces, and calculating the risk is contextual and complicated. So what kind of feces, how's it collected, who's doing the collecting, how's it dried, how's it stored, are all things that would have to go into um, calculating the, the, the risk. But it's clearly an area that needs a lot of attention because these feces are ubiquitous in households and not going away. Any efforts at, at household cleanliness must account for the fact that households don't consider these feces dirty or needing disposal. They're gold. So Moving on, now turning from the underemphasized sources to the underemphasized pathways of transmission. Um, children learn by exploring their environment. They put their hands in their mouth, they put objects. And we have fairly extensive data from both qualitative and quantitative studies in Kenya, Bangladesh, Peru, Zimbabwe, and Zambia. And while the figures of each study vary, the patterns really remain the same. Children eat contaminated soil, they eat it multiple times every day, as do their, their pregnant mothers. And children directly consume poultry turds. So again, you have the data in front of you from those five, five countries. These are from direct observation. We also do have self-reported uh, behaviors from the mothers, not the, not the infants, um, in 
a different Zambia study, 93% of mothers, these were from observations of 30 households, but 93% of the mothers reported observing their children eating soil. And 17% of those mothers reported observing their children eating chicken feces. Again, painting the picture as we talk about EED and the fecal assault on the gut, some of the pathways that this is reaching the children. Continue on underemphasized pathways. Um, the last of underemphasized pathways, and in this case, it's always been in the picture, literally, it's always been there in the F diagrams, but perhaps too much in the shadow is food and food hygiene. Food is among the most important factors in transmitting pathogens that cause diarrheal illness. Uh, it's been estimated in a number of, of key studies that up to 70% of diarrhea among young children could be due to pathogens transmitted through food. While, while a range of pathogens can cause these foodborne diseases, various uh, viruses, bacteria, and parasites pose the greatest share of preventable foodborne threats. Um, food serves as a, as a vehicle for virus and parasite transmission to the new host. However, for bacteria, food also offers an opportunity to grow exponentially as a medium um, for in, to infectious levels. Water, of course, is a critical component of food, food hygiene, playing a significant role at multiple points of food preparation, including washing ingredients, rinsing the utensils, cooking, hand washing, or not. And at the point of consumption, it's really challenging to attribute the extent to which food in isolation contributes to disease transmission exclusive of water. So they're most commonly analyzed together. These studies that I've been talking about uh, looked at the relationship between food hygiene and diarrhea, not, not environmental enteric dysfunction. So in fact, the impact on child growth could be even greater. So as we look explicitly at these underestimated sources and pathways, it begs the question, how best do we block the transmission? that our more traditional wash measures of water quantity, water quality, aren't equipped to be the barriers of transmission, specifically for infants and young children. Excuse me, I'm sorry for that. I thought there was, think there's a sound problem. So um, we were surveying the literature again to um, look at any pioneering interventions that were addressing the underemphasized sources and any data on their effect. Um, we did find several large implementing organizations are already delivering interventions and or developing what we're calling enabling products to address some of these baby wash concerns but with little evidence yet of their effectiveness. Um, just calling out some of the major players, Save the Children, uh, World Vision, uh, the Spring Project with JSI and HKI, Project Concern, Watershed, are all really pioneers in this programming area. Uh, implementing various combinations of the list you see before you, infant, young child, hand washing, animal husbandry, uh, efforts at safe disposal of animal and infant and young child feces, compound hygiene, improved flooring, and play mats and play pens. Um, increasingly, many of these, eff or interestingly, uh, many of these efforts are led by the nutrition sector as opposed to the wash sector, although they do represent a confluence of sectoral approaches, which facilitates multi-sectoral, coordinated, or concerted, uh, integrated efforts. The plausibility of the protective effects of these various interventions has not yet been established for many of the measures. Uh, many questions, in particular, about uh, the thresholds needed for protection and intermittent exposure. And that's a lot of words, but what I mean by that is if a play space intervention 
is attempting to block transmission and exposure if a child sits on that mat for six hours and then off the mat eats a bunch of contaminated soil and and mouths the the father's gum boot back from the field and mouths a bunch of filth, filthy objects does it matter does it make a difference to have the child on that play mat and we just don't have those data yet So looking at the pioneering efforts to break the underemphasized pathways of disease transmission at the hand, infant and child hand washing, animal husbandry, compound hygiene, improved flooring, there's been very little data collection beyond program monitoring to help evaluate the effectiveness of these approaches, including this biological plausibility. A lot of much needed data are being generated, however, as formative research to plan these efforts, things like the observational studies that I was showing you earlier. So just highlighting the range of interventions focusing on the neglected pathways, um, CLTS is beginning to include a focus on infant and young child feces in some efforts, either countrywide and more often uh, through NGO efforts. Safe feces disposal is, the safe infant feces disposal is entering the follow-up actions of post-triggering, as well as verification and certification criteria for ODF. Attention is going towards identifying enabling products like sani scoops, potties, and child-friendly sand flats to facilitate improved disposal of infant and young child feces. Uh, efforts are delivered through both public and private sector approaches for these enabling products, both giving and selling, and a few PPPs. Um, it's important to, to point out that baby wash interventions, either implicitly or explicitly, acknowledge the various developmental stages of infants and young children require different and distinct approaches and technologies. So it's not one focus for all infants and young children. The infant who's still a lap child requires a different approach to safe feces disposal than a toddler off on his or her own. Um, there's early evidence of the importance of, of other new approaches for addressing these underemphasized pathways. Finished flooring may be an effective measure for addressing direct ingestion risks. There's some interesting findings from a Mexico study called the Piso Forme study showing a protective effect, but more recently from Ghana, Ghana showing no effect. So again, mixed results, but of interest. Um, USA Div is currently funding a study in Rwanda that's going to document the uh, impact of improved flooring on health outcomes. Taking a, a quick look at play mats and play spaces, many organizations we found in the range of, of just under 10 in our inventory, we're introducing play mats and a few a playpen, but with little evidence, both guiding the program design or rigorous, rigorous evaluation of the impact. The SHINE study, the trial findings, um, which have been released, will have some additional analyses expected this summer uh, that are expecting to shed some additional light in particular on the safe play space, the playpen interventions. So, some take home messages from our review of the literature review. Um, four points we'd like to leave with you. One is that the relative magnitudes of the transmission pathways of enteric microbes in infant and young children are not well defined, making it hard to conclude which pathways represent the highest risk to infants and young children and where to target intervention. Second, the evidence of traditional wash interventions at reducing risk of diarrhea and improving growth of the under fives is mixed, but that some categories of wash are more effective than others. Underemphasized sources and pathways are significant to infants and young children, and they require more research and evidence-based intervention guidance. And our last takeaway is that a significant evidence gap remains on the effect of various technologies and social behavior change interventions in reducing exposure and improving outcomes. And so for our last 
few slides, what we'd like to uh, present to you is where WASH PALS is moving forward with all these findings. The next steps for WASH PALS and WASH PALS research is that we are preparing a random assignment exposure study in Ethiopia, collaborating with the government of Ethiopia and some USAID implementing partners to test if a playmat playpen combo combination together with motivational behavior change components in fact reduces infant young child exposure to harmful pathogens. Particularly in light of the SHINE findings, we feel it's, it's particularly appropriate to break down the identified research gap into its component parts. And rather than mounting a health outcome study, to first answer that question of biological plausibility. Can the play space reduce exposure? And then the research community can move forward with a health outcome study if, in fact, it's found to be protective. Uh, the study is, as planned will be a phase study starting with a formative research phase that also will include product development of the playpen itself. Somewhat to our surprise, when starting planning for the exposure study, we found that no, plan, no playpen currently exists that's within the financial reach of our target in Ethiopia or globally. Current uh, play play pen models run 60 to 150 dollars and we're aiming more for that 12 to 15 dollar range for a combination play mat and play pen. So we hope to work with another USAID partner to design a play space both a mat and a play pen that again can follow the child through those developmental stages that will be developed to meet uh, locally desirable attributes and tastes of the bottom of the pyramid consumer. And then we'll test, if you will, the concept, not that specific product, but we'll test that concept of the play space. And if we can identify then a safe, affordable, aspirational product, we'll then move on to the uh, exposure study phase also in Ethiopia. We also uh, would like to announce, this is our first public announcement, that uh, we'll we are pre preparing to issue a small grant solicitation for testing behavior change innovations that address the safe management of animal feces. And there will be more details on that in the coming weeks. Uh, and we hope that we've piqued some interest in, in looking at that topic. So with that, we close the official presentation and we open the, the uh, floor to questions and comments. Joining us will be Jeff Albert, the WASH PALS Deputy Director. Moderated and also participating is Jesse Shapiro. Uh, we are trying to get Francis Nagere, our research advisor, on the line, but have been unsuccessful from, from Tanzania. So uh, we'll see if we can get him in the chat box for some of this, but lament that he couldn't be with us today. So with that, we ask you to um, give us your thoughts. And, and thank, thank you for... Thank, thank you for, uh, for listening and participating. Thank you, Julia. Uh, yeah, we've received a couple questions during the webinar that we can start with now. If you have additional questions, please add them to the chat box or the Q&A box, and we'll, we'll address those in turn. So our first question uh, for the panel and you, Julia, is would you say that, would you, would you say that domestic animal feces or chicken feces are a greater risk to child's health because you talked about how uh, there's the the environment where typical open defecation occurs is not necessarily the same environment where these animals are defecating which is around the household so whether or not their pathogen load is higher or lower do you think it's a greater risk to health because that's where the children are are playing and where they occupy that space Jeff, do you want to jump in? Um, yeah, well, I th actually, I mean, I think it's... it's you Jeff, would you like to jump in here? Because the audience has heard quite a bit from me. Uh, it, it, am, um, is, can I be heard okay? Is my, um, is my mic working? Yes, we can hear you, Jeff. Okay. 
Okay, great. Yeah, no, I think um, I think that question. You know, I think it, I was really pleased to see that question because you know you've zero you've zeroed in on the um, on sort of, you know what what we're getting at here. Um, the um, the the literature. You know, there this is animal waste is is very much a a um, uh, has been underemphasized historically in our view based on our review of the literature and and of programming. Um, you know, there was some suggestion in the academic literature about a decade and a half ago that the focus really ought to be on human excreta and not animal excreta, uh, just given the concentration of, of human pathogens versus zoonotic pathogens. But, you know, that that is starting to change. And and, and Julia made, you know, made certainly, you know, made reference to these these papers that identify these associations between um, between domestic animal um, husbandry and um, and rates of infection and and some some you know some evidence of growth faltering you know I th again I, the key, there it's important also to recognize that this and I, you know I'll sort of reemphasize it here that you know the the nutritional benefit of having domestic animals is also s sort of wi widely recognized and so there's this you know domestic animal husbandry you know seems to represent you know represent this this uh, has this dual character of potentially being uh, growth enabling um, because of um, more, you know, better food access um, while also having this, this risk of acute infection. <laughs> and the, and the, the, you know, the, the interplay of those two, of those two effects, the, 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 the food access benefit and the disease risk are, you know, are likely to be geographically, you know, variable um, and, but we're still, you know, I think this is a very rich area of scientific inquiry. Um, but that, you know, that's, that's, that, that's certainly, um, yeah, there's a lot more animal, you know, there often is a lot more animal, uh, excreta, um, in, within these home environments and within these play environments. And that, that's very much what's motivated this part of the Wash Pals project. All right. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, our, our next question is, how can fecal matter of animals or humans be followed over a 24-hour period? How can that uh, environmental fecal contamination be measured, and what is their effect on ambulatory children, for, perhaps over that 24-hour period? Um, the methodological question is certainly a challenge. Um, over a 24-hour period to date, we haven't had following. We have had attempts to follow over a 12-hour period done in shifts. Um, and of course, that would be through, well, not of course, that, that's been through direct observation. So, I mean, the, short, the shortest answer is you, you could either use reported behavior, which is problematic. You can have direct observation, and then there's all kinds of bias because you are introducing a new interloper into the household. And so researchers, again, try to minimize that bias by having the most, the most local person and trained to be as unobtrusive as possible. It's done through observation and through checklists. Um, again, as the most I know is people have done 12-hour shifts, uh, sometimes surprised, sometimes planned. Uh, we did, in our Ethiopia preparations, try and bring some cameras uh, to leave in situ. Uh, specifically, we used if people know they're they're called deer cameras, and they're motion centered cameras that that click on, and you can either do still shots or video. Um, th there's all kinds of issues on on using cameras in households, of course, um, particularly around privacy issues and IRB concerns. So for the outside domain, it's possible. For the inside domain, um, it, it's I'm going to say near impossible to have a camera running inside a house and get IRB approval. And then you have a huge data collection issue, of course, if you're just leaving a camera running. Um, so that's a, a longer answer to say that to date, we don't have 24 hour observation. We use what we'd call sort of proxy observations, um, usually a several, several spells in a house at different hours with folks that are minimizing this. Of risk, it does let us know that um, there's a lot of risk out there. Um, well, I guess I'd also, I think, if looking at the question, uh, the the first part, the first part of the question about how environmental feces, about how environmental fecal contamination can be measured, 
Um, so with with regard to that, um, you know, we, we typically think about uh, um, in, in addition to to scans of the environment, um, we, you know, we typically talk about sampling soil, um, do measuring, uh, trying to measure contamination on hands by doing hand rinses, uh, measuring, you know, swabbing uh, the surfaces of, of toys that children put in their mouth. Those, these are all the kinds of things that are, um, these, these are all the kinds of things that we'll be, be measuring. Um, these are the kinds of environmental samples that our field research will be, will be um, employing. And then, um, and, and then in terms of what, you know, what you measure, you know, historically we've, we've, we've often relied on, on um, uh, coliform bacteria as, as indicators, but you know, I think there's no, we're getting a lot more sophisticated now um, about measuring very specific hu um, human pathogens um, whether in environmental samples or in, um, uh, or in stool samples from infants or, or, or else in, in, uh, you know, in, in more sort of ambitious studies in, in blood as well. Um, so I, I've uh, just, uh, to answer the other part of that question. Thanks, Jeff. So we... Not to go on too long about this. You can tell that we're excited about the topic. Um, but to say that many of the studies to date that we were reporting on, or I should say some of them, actually look at the presence of animals to try and estimate exposure. So it's really only some of the studies that have actually analyzed for animal feces and the bacteria viruses in feces as well. So a lot of the studies just look at animals and then start calculating risk. We have mixed methods going on. Great. Thanks, Julia. So we had a question about the upcoming solicitation for behavior change grants, whether it was global or Ethi just Ethiopia. It is global. Um, the next question is, doesn't the education sector negatively view protective play spaces since it prevents a child from exploring or satisfying their curiosity to whatever it may be or exploring the area? Um, certainly that there is a movement within the ECD sector to not limit the exploration of children. And so it, it is an active dialogue. And clearly the ECD sector also does understand the risk. And there's a range of risks in households, fire, accidents, drowning in, in places like India and, and Bangladesh where you have uh, open pools of water. So uh, we are we are working closely with the ECD sector and and WASH as a sector overall is in conversation. There's a number of of um, coalitions, including the Clean Fed and and Nurtured and Baby Wash coalitions, who have just merged that are are really trying to address this. In short, yes, um, the general trend in ECD is to let a child explore, but that means in a safe and hygienic environment. And so with a clear understanding that most household environments are neither safe nor hygienic, um, we are looking. Um, we also do need to, to, to measure, and when we talk about biological plausibility, um, these play spaces may in fact become vectors of disease themselves. And so part of the, uh, the, this, this exposure study that we are proposing will really look at, at um, just the state of that playpen over time and whether it is protective or not. So thanks for the question. Next question is, has anyone ever tried chicken diapers? Is that Tom Davis on the line? <laughs> uh, um, chicken diapers, I'm smiling because um, Tom Davis, now again with World of Vision, um, has been proposing for years, and I used to have a, a picture of that up on my slides as we talked about it. No one that I know of has tried chicken diapers, and while it's a very funny idea, it is actually a real thing, as well as a do-it-yourself thing, just like we can do do-it-yourself homemade menstrual pads. People have made from old socks and things like that. I can show you all the pattern chicken diapers. So while we joke, it, it, it there is an open invitation that there may be some technologies that help both to concentrate and collect 
uh, feces, particularly ch chicken feces, in a safe, hygienic way. And whether it's diapers or uh, some new kind of coop that that um, systematically can collect, um, it's really it's it's open and it's much needed. So I'll share with folks the chicken diaper uh, patterns if anyone would like to move ahead. But uh, yes, they exist, and know that as far as I know, they haven't been tried. Okay, there's there's another question about uh, looking at what would be the magnitude of an intervention. I guess the question is referring to scale, um, maybe, or intensity of an intervention that would be needed to really achieve hygienic play spaces, especially in, in school environment. Have you thought, have, has that come up in the literature, of, or do you have any thinking on that? Um, um, if any of the others would like to jump in here. So I see that as a two-part question. I'm not quite following by school time. Um, it's a different kind of play space, if you will. We'll be talking more about a playground. Um, and in that case, I would put my focus, and I think most programmers would put the focus on hand washing, sort of after being in that filth, hand washing uh, before any uh, spread happens. So even before eating, you know, when you leave the, the ground. Um, in institutional settings more like nurseries and that sort of school, I certainly don't know of any scale efforts. Um, to answer from the inventory, there there have been interesting efforts in Hawaii that have then been picked up by um, Project Concern International that it, it's actually focused more or spurred from the ECD sector, looking at grandparents as the first teachers and parents as the first teachers, but it does have a play mat and stim toys, toys that would stimulate uh, cognitive and motor skills. Uh, not at scale, but in a pilot effort that's been applied. Again, no rigorous data about the impact of protection. So I don't know of anything at scale. That is what I do know exists. If anyone else or, or our audience, if anyone knows, please opine. All right, thanks, thanks Julia. Um, so there's a question specifically about the study in Ghana regarding floors. Do, do you think is your interpretation of that study, is there evidence there that uh, creating a, a f doing the installing the floors is less or more significant than just cleaning practices in the home? Um, I'm sorry, I'm going to say I don't remember all the details of that study and I will happily share the link. Um, I don't think that it looked, I, I don't even think it was designed to quite answer the question in that way. Um, and in the analysis, it, it really was looking at uh, various uh, different outcomes and found that the floor did not affect the disease outcomes. So the type of floor, whether dirt or... Um, I think, I think again, again what, what you're posing, posing is an important is, um, it's, it's an, an important, important question, question is is it the floor itself versus uh, an effort to clear filth from the from the environment and I don't know of studies at all again ask Jeff or Jesse if anyone knows of of something that's done a comparative study that's when it gets tricky is, is when you're comparing yeah. those different methods would be a fairly complex design. I, I I can't. I also can't remember specifically. I don't. But I don't believe that one of the one of the interventions st studied was cleaning. Uh, I don't think there was a comparison there between um, that 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 com uh, between floor the the protective effects of of flooring versus th those of, of cleaning. You know, I think we have to be careful when we talk about flooring. There we have one uh, large. Um, uh, observational study as that Julie mentioned from Mexico um, in an urban environment um, um, with cement flooring that 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 was really that was really encouraging and and um, the folks who do um, who do wash epidemiology are very excited about the potential of flooring and and I, I think this this study that that uh, Julie also referenced that that is um, due to happen in Rwanda uh, of of a novel um, earthen flooring innovation that's being deployed there by a by a um, by a commercial uh, by a commercial entity in Rwanda is is should hopefully kind of uh, shed light on this um, and and you know remember we're, we're a, lot, a lot of the thrust of this presentation and of our work in in this part of the project is on the fact that that um, infants and young children eat. Um, a lot of dirt 
Um, it's increasingly recognized that they do that and that they even directly eat excreta. And um, the, you know, the, the logic here uh, is that, is that on, a, on a finished floor, it's much easier to keep clean. Uh, it's much easier to identify, it potentially is easier to identify excreta and clean it. Um, but as to whether that's going to, um, whether having an, an inter interior floor, um, again, uh, g pr pr gives you, is a biologically plausible uh, uh, intervention. Um, yeah, we're, we're not there yet, but it's, it's an area of great interest. So, yeah, it's a space you should be watching. Thanks, Jeff. Um, so we're getting to some more questions that may be kind of falling outside of the scope of this literature review, but maybe you can shed some light on or have opinions or insights into. So one is about, um, have you seen or do you know of any evidence about, uh, they use the word cascade, cascade of wash practices emanating from the school to the home environment. So essentially working with school children and then that uh, moving into the homes. I'll pause for a minute to see if my co-presenters. Um, I can highlight right. Oh, actually, would you like to talk about Zambia? Um, I, I will mention, uh, maybe we'll get a word or two on Zambia next. Um, Wash Pals is funding a small activity now that's looking specifically at at hand washing and nudges and the the application of nudges in schools and a transfer to home. That's not quite a, a good characterization of that study because it also will just look at the application of nudges at the home setting in isolation, but there'll be a link there. Um, there has been documentation over the years of children as change makers and, and um, I'm just not well versed enough in the data to report, but I mean, it's certainly a role, but I don't, I don't know the particulars. Great. Thanks, Julia. So, uh, any more questions? I think we've exhausted the ones that have been put into the question answer I box. A, I see a question about, uh, about animal containment, about slinkies that limit chicken grazing, uh, the, the range of grazing chickens. Um, right. I think that was more of a suggestion. One of uh, the uh, participants suggested that he's seen another device, the mm -hmm. slinky type device, or maybe some sort of leash type device mm -hmm. that's used for grazing chickens and is portable. So there are obviously are some sort of technologies out there that might need to be explored in this in this space. You know, it, I think it would be helpful just to re just to remark to the attendees that. Um, you know, we, within this project, we, we are spending a lot of time thinking about the question, you know, we, we've been talking about containing kids in, 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 in these safe play spaces. And, 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 and thankfully, you know, there was a, this question about uh, early child development and the potential downsides of, of limiting kids. You know, then there, there's the question, well, rather than limiting the, you know, containing the kids, should we be thinking about containing the animals or or, or should we be thinking of just of, of measures to separate the two? And um, you know, I, we, um, there, there's, we have great great interest in that in the project. And to the degree to which you've witnessed or are developing or executing measures to to keep um, infants and children away from animals in domestic uh, um, animal husbandry contexts, you know, we want to know about them, um, and we want to learn as much as we can to to um, to help foster that innovation moving forward. Great. All right, uh, I think we've exhausted all the questions, so we can, uh, we'll wrap up the webinar now. Um, so just as some final notes, you'll see on the last slide that being, being shared now, there's some contact information for myself and Julia. Uh, feel free to reach out to us if you have additional questions on this literature review. Also, if you click on the right-hand side of the screen, there's a tab for handouts. You can actually download a copy of the presentation and a copy of our literature review there. Um, so that maybe help answer a lot of your questions. Um, but please feel free to reach out if you have additional things. I want to thank everyone for joining today. Um, we had a 
up around 50 participants and 43 of you have hung in till the very end. So it shows a lot of interest in this area. We have a lot of excitement and interest in this area and look forward to pursuing some of our uh, behavior change grants and research areas and partnering with, with many of you going forward. So thank you so much for joining today. Um, take care. Thanks. Bye.